Crazy year of uh, Corona and people having to be at home by themselves. I want to share. I want to share with you some insights into the Pesach Seder, the Haggadah, some uh, some ideas that uh, that we have done um, that hopefully will me be meaningful for you um, as well as uh, for all those participating at the Seder. Alrighty. So what I want to do is just run through what happens at the Seder, what you do at the Seder, and um, can I just get a thumbs up from those who uh, that you can actually see me? I'm not glitching. Okay. All righty. Excellent. All righty. So, um, of course, the, the, the one of the greatest nights of the year is Pesach Seder. No, no other year, no other night in the year is as filled with uh, with ritual, with family, and in fact, the Seder night is the oldest, as far as I know, the oldest ritual meal uh, in the world. The, uh, if we take the dates from the Torah correctly, then it's over 3,300 years that, uh, that there's been a Seder being conducted every single year. And uh, it's interesting that the very first Seder that was performed was the Jewish people uh, at, uh, at, uh, in Egypt itself. And what, is, uh, and what is expected from the Jews sitting at the Seder is that they would uh, try and recall both the, uh, the slavery and the, and the celebration. So what we're going to try to do this evening is I'm going to run with uh, run you through some of the ideas that uh, the Seder is trying to trying to share for, share with us and trying to achieve and uh, how to make it as yeah, as interactive as possible even if you can't uh, unfortunately this year uh, be with family. So I'm going to show you a couple of tricks that we do at the Luan Seder, um, the ideas that you can take to your Seder and hopefully make it as meaningful as possible. All right, so let's uh, let's begin. So uh, in front of in front of you, you have me uh, be speaking, and I hope you can see uh, the seder, the the PowerPoint of the seder itself. So the um, the seder is a special meal uh, that is celebrated on the night of the fifteenth of Nisan, uh, which we call first night Pesach. In the diaspora, we get the added advantage of two seders, and the seder is an ex uh, is an educational experience, and it's uh, and it's asking us to reenact. The, uh, the exodus from Egypt uh, in a way that is different from any other meal, any other experience that we have during the year. It is that uh, the Sadie's ask is calling to parents to act as educators, master educators, and for, uh, and, for the, and for the generations to share experiences one from the other. Now, what do you need for a Seder? In order to run a successful Seder, we're going to need a couple of things. Number one, uh, the, the Haggadah. The book that we'll be reading and the Haggadah that we're going to be reading, ideally you want to try have the same Haggadah for everybody. Otherwise, you're going to have what page you on, what page, where are we, where are we. Uh, the second one is the Seder plate, known as the Kaara. The third one is Matzah, and we need lots of that, as I'll show you later, as well as wine and grape juice. We're going to need enough for four cups for each person. Uh, this year, with uh, with the social distancing, that's a bit easier. But if you're hosting big seders in future years, you'll need to make sure that there's enough matzah for all the participants as well as enough wine for four cups per person. You will need a table, uh, which you decorate. A lot of people add in songbooks in addition to the Haggadah, and I'll, and I'll uh, share with you some of the songs that we use, as well as props for the seder. As, as we go through the seder, I'm going to share with you some of those as well. So, the first thing is the Haggadah. The Haggadah is, uh, that we use for the Seder lists 15 steps that we have to work our way through in the order of the night. The word Seder literally means an order. And there's an order and, expect and, and, a, and a process that we're going to work you through, starting from Kadesh all the way to Nirza. The word Haggadah is, uh, is, is rooted in the Hebrew word Lahagid, which means to tell or to teach your children. And uh, we're gonna, and as I mentioned before, try to try get the same Haggadah for everybody. Um, I've listed a couple on the PowerPoints. Uh, the one at the top here is the the Harry Potter Haggadah, uh, the regular Haggadahs, and then the Haggadahs for each child according to their age. Now, a very important point to make, and that uh, some people miss this, is that the entire Haggadah can be done. The whole Seder can be done in English. 
Right? The, the main focus of the Seder night is that everyone understands what's going on at the Seder. So don't be, don't get caught up in trying to read every single word in Hebrew. That's not what the, that's what the, that's not what the night's about. It's about experiencing and sharing the story. So if it means everyone reading in English, that's not a problem. If I can tell you the hand on heart is that our Seder, we do run the Seder in English. Besides the songs, uh, the rest of the Seder is done in English so that I can make sure that all my kids understand what's going on at the Seder. Next. Uh, the, uh, in terms of our Seder and the ingredients that we need, the, the first thing we need is, uh, is our Seder plate. And the Seder plate is a special plate which has six special foods on them that uh, are eaten, or at least uh, in theory, eaten at the Seder. The, uh, the first one is the egg, which, uh, which represents the, fe the festival sacrifice known as Korban Chagiga. The second one is the shank bone, which uh, represents the uh, paschal lamb that was eaten at the Seder. That used to be a lamb on a spit. We don't have a temple anymore, so replace it either with a chicken bone or a chicken neck, um, just as a, as a symbol. And then we have this, uh, the symbols of slavery. We have haroset, which represents the, uh, the cement or the mortar that the Jews ate in the, in, while they were in Egypt. We have the chazeret, which is the, the lettuce leaves. We have the salt, uh, the salt, uh, the salt, uh, the salt, uh, salt water. Um, you might say, in my picture I picked over here, we've got parsley, and we have the, uh, the horseradish maror uh, to increase the bitterness of the experience. And each of these foods are significant in their own right. And I'd just like to preface and say like this, in the same way as we spend so much time preparing the house for Pesach in terms of cleaning the house and getting rid of the chametz, we also have, we have an equal obligation or just as important obligation to prepare for the Seder. You can't just walk into the Seder. In the same way, if you have a very important meeting, you, uh, you, walk, you, uh, you can't walk in unprepared. You have to have your facts straight. And there's no more important meeting that can happen in a year than the Seder, uh, than the Seder. Why is this? Because when we're sitting at the Seder, and again, this year is, uh, we, I don't think we need to say, why is this night different from what other nights? I think we've got that clear. But in future Seders, please God, next year, when we're sitting down at the Seder with our extended family, uh, we, are, we, know, we are talking to the different generations. We want to make sure that the messages we want to share with them are messages that they will take with them uh, into the future. So I just like to I like to preface the whole evening just with a story to, uh, to explain to you what this means. Forty uh, to, to ten years ago, I had a, co a cousin of mine for, came uh, came for Seder uh, from Melbourne. Him and his family. It was the first time that we had been together for almost fifteen years, and the two of us were sitting at the table, and we took the places. Uh, and we set the table up with the adults at the top of the, of the table, of the table, and the children at the bottom of the table. And I and I picked up the matzah, and I held it when I was doing the yachatz of breaking the matzah, and I held it up to my kids, and they were a lot younger then, and his kids were a lot younger then. And I said to them, "I'm going to share you a story this evening that your that my my cousin and I heard from our grandparents 40 years ago, when we were your age, the little guys at the table." Because we remember our Seder of seeing the, the grandparent generation, the grandfather who came from Russia, the grandparent father who came from, from, uh, from England, and the grandfather who came from Germany, sitting at the head of the table, sharing the story of the Seder. And the amazing thing was, the story that they told was exactly the same story as I was sharing with, uh, with my children and my, my, my cousin's children at that Seder. So Seder night is a, is a magical night in which we link the generations one to the other. And this has to be, uh, has to be uh, mentioned uh, right at the start. Now, in terms of our ingredients, the other thing we're going to need is matzah. And uh, we need three matzot per person. Right? Three matzot per person. Most of us think that the only person who has to have the matzah is the, is the person leading the Seder. That's, no, that's not true. We have for the, the show the three matzah at the beginning. But in terms of the meal, every single person has to have a say, the, the three matzot. Now, in reality, you can use any matzot, right? And I've got, and I've got, the, uh, and I've got the, the traditional uh, machine-baked matzah over here. Uh, other people try to use hand-baked shmura matzah. 
The reason for hand-baked is that's what they ate all the, for the thousands of years. Uh, the matzah that we have today, this one, the, uh, the machine bake is only about 150 years old as a tradition. This one is thousands of years. So on the night of the Seder, when we're sitting down, we want to try and have as, uh, as much of a connection to the previous generations as possible. So when we sit down in the Seder, we talk about it the Seder, our, uh, our grandparents or our great-grandparents can look over our shoulders and say, this is exactly the Seder that we did whether it was in in uh, in Baghdad, whether it was in uh, in Vilna, whether it was in Casablanca, whether it was in Johannesburg, wherever it was, there's a there's a there's a and the events that the Seder unites us around the world, the generation at the table and the generations that went before us. The other the, the next the next major obligation we need for our Seder is to have wine. And we go, and one of the main obligations is to have four cups of wine during the seder. Now, I'm not sure of your ability, how 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 good how you how your alcohol uh, retention is, but the minimum cup, sh- minimum each cup should be is 86 mils, which is about a cheekful, right? Uh, yeah, that we drink each time. We uh, when we drink the wine, we're going to lean to the left, as uh, as drink as as leaning was a symbol of freedom in the days of the temple. Anyone who's seen the old uh, movies with the Romans or has read Asterix and Obelix comics will see the, the, Ro- the, the Romans reclining on the chairs. Uh, that is the symbol we're trying to um, recreate. Why do we lean to the left? The Talmud says to us, if you lean to the right, you'll choke. Okay. Now of the, now of the Seder, two, two of the cups are drunk before the meal and two are going to be di- drunk after the meal. So that's the four. But here's the good news. You can drink additional cups of wine during the meal, and they don't count for the for the, the official four. So as long as you can keep your head on your on your shoulders by the by the time you get to Chad Gadya, um, you can have two at the beginning before the meal, as many as you want in the meal, and then two again at the end of the meal. Uh, one can use any strength of wine. Some people use quite strong wine, some dilute it, some go for grape juice, and you can even dilute the grape juice if the grape juice is too, is too much, uh, much for you. But the, uh, but the obligation is to enjoy the, for the four cups of wine at the Seder. Now, the table. The table that we set for our Seder, we want to try and make it as best as possible. And yeah, so I've shown you, I've shown you a couple of pictures. Um, this, is, uh, this is one that my sister did in Israel, um, and this is uh, what other people have done. The idea is you want to make the Seder, your Seder table as creative, most dec- as decorative as possible, uh, trying to tell the story, have cushions there to be, uh, to be comfortable so that you can enjoy the, uh, the evening. So again, in not only do, uh, do we focus on preparing the house and get rid of the chomets, we also need to prepare the house uh, for the Seder. I've heard of families in, pre- in previous years who have uh, gone to the gone to the extreme of take of of uh, creating a, almost a red sea effect as you walk into the house there's uh, it's, it's decorated with uh, with with blue uh, uh, uh with blue fabric and, and fish so you're walking actually into a whole new experience that takes a bit of uh, creative talent and artistic talent but that's the level uh, of experience we want to try to share remember we are sharing the seder with our, our children and our grandchildren we want them to have a memory that will exist uh, for, for them to share with their children and their grandchildren as well. So, the fir- what are the steps that we're going to work our way through this evening? All right, the 15 steps are, for, according to the song, Kadesh, Shulchatz, Karpas, Yachatz, Magid, Rokza, Motzi, Matza, Maro, Korech, Shulchan, Norech, Shafun, Barech, Halel, Nirza. So each of these uh, each of these fifteen stages starts with kadesh, the washing of the uh, the, the kiddush, urchatz, washing of the hands, karpas, dipping greens into salt water, breaking of the matzah yachatz, magid, telling the story, rochza, washing your hands again. Okay, so although some people suggest that this year it should go kadesh, urchatz, karpas, urchatz, magid, yachatz, urchatz, that for each stage you should be washing your hands. Um, but we have a double washing, and we have to understand why a double washing. Um, I discussed that in a previous year, which you can look on, on YouTube. Um, then Motsi and Matzah, 
Maror, eat, eat in the bitter herbs. Korech is a hill or sandwich. We'll talk about it later. And then the longest part of the whole Seder is this one, Shulchan Orech, the meal. And most people, if you look at the time for the Seder, the first, the first section takes about an hour, an hour and a half. The second half takes about 45 minutes. The main part of your Seder is going to be your meal with your, with your multiple, uh, multiple uh, levels. And then... Sorry. Sorry, is that what that, was he talking to me? What? All right. All right. Gonna. Okay. All right. So step one, we get we get everyone to sit down for kiddush. And the meal starts like every other Kiddush, every other festival or Shabbat, by reciting the Kiddush. And everyone gets a cup of wine. However, the tradition in, in, my, in, my, in our home is that because on this night we are free, we don't pour our own wine. We, uh, it's like sitting at the restaurant, we put out our cups, and then the waiter pours the wine for us. So each person, uh, each pers- we do, the way we do it is, you pour wine for the person on your right, and this way, everyone is, uh, is serving someone else, but at the same time has a sense of being a free person by having the wine poured for you. Everyone lifts up the cup for Kiddush and then uh, recites the Kiddush in, uh, as per your tradition. And then we drink, make sure, leaning to the left. Now, what happens if you don't lean to the left? Right? Some people say... You... Yeah? Hello? Right. Um, right. So the first, the first stage is Kadesh. Afterwards, what we'll do, what normally happens in a, in your in your in your Friday nights, is that everyone gets up to wash their hands. And the Seder nights, or Chatz, only the leader of the Seder gets to wash hands. Uh, a basin of water is of and washing cup are brought to the table. Wash their hands. No blessing is recited. And the question then becomes is why, why is this happening? And the answer very simply is that, it, uh, that it's going to uh, lead the child to ask a question of why is this night different from all other nights? Some houses, everyone washes, and that's okay too. For, so whatever your tradition is, for, for Urchatz, follow your tradition. Karpas, the third step, pick up the parsley. Uh, it can be any vegetable. Uh, we use parsley, which is then dipped into salt water. And um, we start the blessing and, there, and you eat the parsley. I've heard, I've heard a tradition to use potatoes. Some people use potatoes. And I've even heard some people use bananas, which is also a, uh, a vegetable or a herb. The reason for that is it causes the child to ask a question, Manishtana, what's going on? This is completely different from our normal Seder. One of the, 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 one of the reasons why uh, we use karpas, and I like to use karpas, is that karpas is, is green, symbolizing the spring in Israel. But there's, a, yeah, there's another reason that we use karpas. That it is an acre, when we dip the karpas into the salt water, it is reminiscent of two acts of dipping. What got us into Egypt was the dipping of, the, of, the, of Joseph's coat into blood. When the brothers hated Joseph and they sold him down to Egypt, they dipped the coat into blood, send the, uh, the, uh, the coats back to his father, and this is what starts the, uh, ultimately starts the exile of the Jews going down to Egypt. What's if uh, the sin was sinar a hatred of Jews for one another, what was going to bring us out of Egypt was going to be an act of dipping as well. And that's our dipping the, uh, the hyssop into the, the blood of the, uh, the Paschal Lamb and smearing it on the door, that was an atonement for the, uh, that original dipping that caused all the problems for the Jewish people. So dipping the carpus in the salt water symbolically represents what the Jews in Egypt did on the night of the, of the, night of the 15th, that fateful night when they themselves would dip uh, some, uh, some green hyssop into the blood. So we, so we symbolically do the same action. Yachatz. This is where things start getting a bit interesting. The leader of the Seder will take the matzot, the three matzot, and he removes the middle one, and he breaks them into two. 
the big one he packs away for afikoman, and the smaller one he leaves uh, on the table. And uh, for afikoman, there are two traditions. The one tradition is, and that's uh, our, the one we do in our house, is that the adults hide the afikoman, and then the children have to run around to try and find them, and then the one who finds it gets a prize. The other tradition is that the children try steal afikoman from the adults, and then it's the adults who have to run around the house to try and find the, uh, the afikoman, and then uh, have to uh, beg, borrow, or uh, barter, or negotiate with the kids uh, to get the afikoman back to finish the meal. Uh, we'll talk about afikoman a little bit later in the meal. Now, the reason why we break the matzah, and, the, and if you're reading through your Haggadah, if, even if someone's never done a Seder before, it's, uh, it's preferable to get a Haggadah that actually has all the explanations what to do each stage. And Haggadot are very, uh, are very clear, this, uh, do this, do this, do this, do this, and just follow the steps, even if you've never led a, se- a Seder before. The, um, the reason why we break this matzah is that the, is that the matzah, matzah represented the food that they ate in Egypt. It's a hard cracker, it does not spoil, and the slaves could, uh, could, uh, could keep it for a long time. So a broken piece of bread was what the slaves would scrounge around for. And this is, uh, and this is how we start our Seder, by holding up the matzah and saying, Halach ma'anya, this is the bread that our, father, that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Who's ever hungry, let them come and eat. At this stage, the child is so confused and he goes, what's going on? Manish dena laila zeh, this night is completely different from any other night I've experienced in my life. Where's the bread? There's no more, there's only matzah. Why are we doing dipping? Why did we lean? All these experiences, the child is totally confused. And this is what leads to, uh, this uh, prompts the child to ask the question. And this gets us into the next stage, uh, the main section of the Haggadah called the Magid. Right? We take away the table, the second cup is filled, the child, uh, the child asks the four questions. And the question is, uh, which I'll let you de- debate at your Seder, is Manishtana. Four questions, or is it one question with four parts, or is it, uh, or is it Manish Tana is the question and the four and the Shabbat Lelot is actually the answer? I'll leave that for you to uh, to discuss at your at your seders. So the seder begins with Avadim Ayinu, with a, with a quick summary of the story that we are slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and Hashem took us out. The reason why we so immediately could jump to the answer and not wait for the whole thing, is that quite often you have little people at the Seder, and they're not going to go, go through the whole night. So we tell the answer right at the beginning, and then we explain it in much more detail uh, through the different, uh, different stories. The story of the five rabbis in their long, long Seder. Uh, and then we get to a very important, uh, important section, which is the story of um, the four sons. The reason why the four sons is so important is that the Torah in four different places, in the mentions this mitzvah of the night of the Seder talking to your children. And the rabbis are very, uh, were very careful and, uh, to pick up the nuance of the text. And Hebrew is an amazing language that every letter, every word has a slight nuance, a slight teaching that is different from anything else. So when the, uh, so when the Torah talks about ma'avodah zot lachem, it's able to say this child, this sounds like a question of a simple child. Uh, or a wicked, the wicked child, or this clever child. And the, and the author of the Haggadah is telling us the following. It's an instruction to the parent. It says, when you're looking at your Seder, look at the children that are there. How are you going to connect with each and every single one of them? How are you going to connect with everyone at your Seder? So at my Seder, I'm going to have a, uh, at, uh, to a number of teenagers and a number of prior primary school kids. How do I, how do I make this, the Seder evening meaningful for each one of them that they walk out of the Seder and go, wow, that was incredible. That's, uh, that's the question that we should all have and all be thinking of in the lead up to the Seder. So um, the, the text of Magid, and this is something that uh, uh, this is going to share some ideas with you, is, um, is a, an analysis, Talmud Torah, it's analysis of biblical verses and how the rabbis interpreted the verses. What, I, what I've done in, uh, in, say, in, the, in the Seders at our house over the years is that there were years when my, my kids were very much younger that I actually just uh, skipped the section in terms of reading it 
but told the story of the Exodus all the way through to Vayishi Amda and then through to the Ten Plagues. So I would start off with uh, getting dressed and you need to make, try to get the props. As I mentioned in the beginning, you need to have props for your Seder. So for example, uh, I make sure to have uh, King Pharaoh come, uh, coming to my Seder. Right? Um, it's very, right? I'll, I might have uh, Moses arriving at the Seder. Right? So, um, uh, or, or get the kids to dress up. Oops. Uh, or get, or get uh, Moses, uh, Moses arriving at the Seder. And then I've got another piece for the, uh, for the beard. All right? So it's, uh, the idea is that we want to have fun at the, at the Seder night. We want to try and create uh, an experience uh, for the children. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to get out to the shops and get to fairer hats, um, but this is, uh, this is one thing that, 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 that we do. So I normally dress up as, as Pharaoh. And we tell the story about the exodus from Egypt like this, with me with the with the pharaoh for the pharaoh gear at uh, at the seder. And one of the uh, the things that we do is we uh, we manage to get all these different face masks over the years. So he has uh, so when it comes to talking about the the plagues, so you got uh, the frogs, and we've got the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 these ones, and then you got the wild the, the wild beasts. Uh, and you can get every uh, each uh, each member of the family to wear a different face mask, uh, and even more important, or, or, or like this, you can divide up before the seder and say to them, "I want you to give us some ideas for, from the seder itself." Now, uh, looking at the blood, um, one of the is a chance is a chance to actually do a bit of magic, and I'll just I'll just show you how the magic trick uh, how the magic trick works. So um, in the story. Of the of the seder, we are told that when it came to the the plague of the blood, that um, the for the Jews they drank water, and for the Egyptians and Pharaoh, whenever he tried to drink uh, water, it had turned into blood. So uh, Pharaoh came up with a brilliant idea, and he said, "Well, if that's the case, let me get the Jews to pour me the water, because if they pour the water into my cup, it'll have to be water." So, um, so at the Seder, I do this. I bring out a glass and I say to my kids, okay, one of them, when they were younger, they didn't know how the trick worked. I tell them, pour for me the water. So they pour the water. And miraculously, the water turned to blood. Uh, and then I would tend to drink it. And like uh, my, my younger, the younger ones scream, no, don't drink it. What's what? It's, it's blood. All right, so, so this needs a little... So, so a magician never te- te- tells his tricks, but the, uh, but the rabbi will. All you need to do is fill a glass with a little bit of uh, grape juice or wine at the bottom, have it covered with, uh, with the cup uh, at the beginning of the Seder with the serviette so that uh, the kids don't see it. And then when it comes to the mirror, they're telling the, telling the story, they pour the water, the water turns to blood. So that's, uh, and that, that creates, that, that's again creating uh, a memory for, uh, for the children. I'll never forget my, my, my one son, when he was four years old, I did this to him. His face went absolutely white that, uh, that, uh, that, the, that the, the water had been cursed in our house to turn into blood. But that's a, that's a memory that he'll keep for the rest of his life and the rest of the people at the Seder as well. The, um, ooh, it gets quite warm. The, then, first, see, going back, ah, see, ah, I must, Okay, when it comes to the songs like Dayenu or the, the Ten Plagues, right, um, it goes like okay, each, each family does their, their own trick and own shtick. Uh, we normally have a big fight about how, after how many rounds of Dayenu do you actually sing Dai Dayenu? Uh, we go, uh, uh, it's either two or three, and there's always a, a, an argument which if that was number two or that was number three. But that's all part of the fun. And as, and as the wine flows, the songs get louder. And um, we have a Jewish neighbor and we, uh, we challenge each other to Dayenu, which, uh, which one makes the loudest noise uh, and for which one will the cops arrive uh, to try to shut down the party. But uh, that's part of the fun and games of, uh, of, say, of, uh, of Seder night. So the first, so uh, we work our way through the Seder and then we get to the section called Rabban Gamliel. And the point of Rabban Gamliel is 
that they are, we have to make mention that Seder night is, a, is, yes, it's about an experience and teaching, and it's about eating, and it's about sharing messages. And he says there are three core messages that you need to share with the, uh, with the participants of your Seder. The one is Pesach, that God does miracles for us. That uh, God uh, the, and carry uh, passed over the houses of the uh, of the of the Jews and struck the uh, the Egyptians. The matzah is uh, is how the story is a, is a transformative story. How we had bread that symbolizes slavery becomes the uh, the symbol of uh, of freedom, and then we conclude. No, 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 I took Sorry, and then and then we conclude and then we conclude with the uh, with a with a praise to Hashem and okay. and a thanksgiving. So it's a, so in the in the in the text of the Haggadah, there's a there's a very powerful line that says, uh, "Bechol dor vador." Uh, in uh, in each uh, in each generation, uh, a person should uh, should view himself or herself as if they came out of Egypt, right? And uh, and this really is the sense of what we're trying to achieve on the on this night of Seder, right? With what I what I want to try and share with my children. Is that we are we are almost going in a time machine, and the time and the time machine is going to take us from uh, from now 2020 all the way back to Egypt, and then we're going to jump forward in time to the uh, to the world of the Seder uh, to the world of, of of Temple times. So we go we leave Egypt, and one of the uh, the beautiful uh, texts in a in a, in after Bechol Dovador, before we sing Hallel, is we say, And we will sing to God a very new song, Hallelujah. Right? We sing, And the question, of course, is that makes no sense because was 3,300 years ago. Why would you sing such a happy, why would you call it a Shira Chadasha, a new song, when it happened so long ago? The answer is that we're supposed to feel as if we were actually walking out of Egypt, as if we are sitting at uh, standing at the at the, uh, the the Red Sea as it's about to pass, and therefore our song is going to be the new song for us. We've never we've never experienced this before. So one of the ways that the rabbis explain the Seder night, they say like this, is that in don't look at time as a timeline, rather view time as a spiral. And when I'm looking at Seder night, I'm looking almost through a telescope through history. And I can see the different Seder, the different Pesachs year after year, time after time. And as such, I'm going to go from 20, Pesach 2020, I'm going to jump into this time machine, go down to Pesach Mitzrayim, Pesach of Egypt. I'm then going to move my way through to a later Pesach, the Pesach that takes place in the temple. And some of the rituals that we're going to show you now in part, in part two of the Seder has to do with what took place in the days of the temple. So let's begin. So first up, Rochza, we wash our hands. Right? And this is the traditional hand washing. Right? Hold the cup, left hand, right hand, left hand, right, right hand, left hand. Uh, say the blessing, on the let your dime. And then one sits in silence until one says the blessing over the matzah. Right. How do we do that? So you hold you hold the three sheets of matzah. We uh, we then say the blessing of hamotzi leche mina aretz. We then drop the uh, the bottom matzah. So now we're only holding two, which is the uh, the full sheet and the half sheet that we just that we had broken earlier for yachatz, and then we say a special blessing of. Al achilat matzah, right? Al achilat matzah, and this is the mitzvah. On Seder night, there's a special mitzvah to eat matzah. The rest of Pesach, you can't eat bread, but there's no mitzvah to eat matzah, right? We can't eat bread the whole eight days. There's no mitzvah to eat matzah all eight days. We like to eat matzah all eight days. There's no mitzvah. Only on the first night of the Seder is there a mitzvah to eat matzah, and therefore we cite the blessing, When we eat the matzah, we lean to the left as a, as a symbol of, uh, of, of our freedom, and we do not eat until we finish eating that, if we do not speak until we finish eating that, uh, that sheet and a half of matzah. But don't worry, you have nine minutes to finish, uh, to finish eating that, uh, those two sheets, 
that's uh, that's that should be plenty of time for everyone once you've had your two glasses of wine you've had a sheet and a half of matzah we now come to maror and the tradition is we take the maror we dip it into the charoset and we recite a blessing of eating maror now since maror represents the bitterness of slavery we don't lean it's a symbol of slavery rather than a symbol of freedom. So we don't lean. We just sit up straight, eat the, eat the maro. And you've got a choice of maro. You can either go with the lettuce or you can go with the horseradish. And the reason why we dip, the, dip it into the uh, charoset is that the charoset symbolized the mortar that the Jewish people uh, had to make for, uh, to, to bake into the bricks. And there was the, this was part of the bitterness of the, of the exile that they had to eat. Now, Ashkenazi charoset is very sweet. So the question, and it actually dulls the taste of the maror. So the question is, if it dulls the taste of the maror, well, doesn't that defeat the purpose? So there's an argument amongst the commentators as to what is this, the symbol of charoset. For most people, if I had to ask you at uh, this moment, and you can share with your families afterwards, the symbol of charoset, you will say to me, is a symbol of slavery, because that's what the Jews ate uh, that's what the Jews had to make while they're in Egypt. It's the, the symbol of the slavery. However, in the original promise that God gave to, Moses, to, to Abraham, he says, your children will be enslaved for 400 years. And the Torah tells us that, the only, that they left after 210 years. So what happened? Why did they leave 190 years earlier? Explain the, uh, the commentators as follows. That the suffering in Egypt was so bad, that if God had left them there any longer, they would have disappeared. So Hashem says, so Hashem cuts the timing of the exile because of the difficulty of the slavery. So because of the charoset right, and the difficult slavery that they had to endure, they had 190 years of their sentence commuted and they left after 210 years. So I ask you the question again, is charoset a symbol of slavery or a symbol of freedom? Right, because through the slayer, through the making of this charoset or the further the mortar, the Jewish people were actually left earlier. So by placing the maror and dipping it into the charoset and blunting the taste of the of the maror, we're actually saying that we blunted the bitterness of the exile and were able to leave a little bit earlier. Now we come to the original hamburger. Now, uh, most of us, when we're looking at charos, at the, at the korech section, the hilo sandwich, what we, uh, we know is we take the, uh, the piece of matzah, put some maror on it, put another piece of matzah on it, and we, uh, and, we eat the, and we eat the sandwich. In the days of Hillel, which was in the days of the Second Temple, the Torah, the Torah mandated as follows, that you have to eat, that you have to enjoy a korban Pesach, the Paschal lamb. And the Paschal lamb was eaten... To, uh, eaten together with matzah and maror, right? the three symbols that Robin Gamlin had mentioned, all come to all fused together in this hillel sandwich. If you look at the way that the uh, the original hillel sandwich was constructed, it is a, it was a hamburger, bread, matzah, lettuce, meat, and bread on top. So the uh, so the korech was the original hamburger. Now, did the did the matzah that they eat? in the temple times resemble our matzah, the cracker, or was it more like a laffa bread, a, a softer, a softer matzah? Um, I would, uh, you, can, you can probably have a strong argument that was a softer matzah than the one we have today. The reason we, we go with the cracker, if we're so worried that there are chomets, that maybe some of them doesn't bake through properly, we'd rather go extreme and have a hard cracker than the softer uh, laffa. But, uh, but if I take the laffa example, then really we did have a hamburger being eaten in, in, in Israel uh, on Pesach 2,000 years ago. The meal. Uh, for most of us, the most exciting part of the Seder is definitely the meal and the different courses. One of the interesting things about the courses of the meal is the first course. Uh, most people start off their Seder with eggs in salt water. And you look in the in the Haggadah, and I've got uh, I've got two shelves of different Haggadot, and I look at the Haggadot, and very they they don't mention this tradition of egg in salt water, yet everyone has 
at least in Ashkenazi communities, egg in salt water. So the question is, why, did, why was this the very poor first part of the meal? The second question you have to ask yourself is, why, why egg in salt water? Egg, egg, if I had to ask you, what is a symbol of sadness or mourning? You'll say an egg, a hard-boiled egg in salt water. Salt representing the tears and the sweat. Egg, symbol of, a symbol of mourning. Why are we eating that symbol of mourning at the start of our Seder? So the answer given is as follows. That the, uh, that the egg represented something called the Korban Chagiga. In the days of the temple, our Seder looked very slightly different to the one that we have. It was a, ma- it was a massive barbecue. We tell the story about the egg uh, like we do. We drink the two cups of wine, and then we'd sit down to the meal. And the first part of the meal was called the festival sacrifice, which was, uh, it was meat uh, prepared, brought to the temple. And then when we were full, they would then wheel in, a, a, they would then wheel in the, the lamb on the spit called the Korban Chagiga, the, the, the Korban Pesah, the Paschal Lamb. That was then eaten with matzah and maror. And that was eaten at the end of the meal. Why the end of the meal? Because that's the time when you're full. And you wouldn't, uh, and you wouldn't sh- shove the food into your mouth. And the idea of the Paschal, eating the Paschal lamb was a symbol of royalty. Royals do not, do, do never, are never hungry. They've always got food. So when they eat, they eat refined, well, with refinement. They eat with, uh, with delicately, they eat slowly. And this is what we're trying to achieve with the Paschal lamb. So we start the meal. We don't have a temple anymore, so we don't have. We aren't able to eat the the foods like the temple. So we start with the the chagiga, the the egg in the salt water, symbolizing the that uh, that first sacrifice. And then at the end of the meal, when we eat afikoman, that was supposed to be the paschal lamb. Just an interesting point. There's a, something known as at bash, which is a way that the uh, the rabbis interpret they learn out uh, n- n- numer- numerological uh, ideas. And they go like this, that Aleph is, uh, Aleph is replaced by a Tav. So it's a, a code. And Aleph is number one, and Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, being one, being the first day of Pesach, corresponds to a, 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 a Jewish festival, a Jewish day in the year, which begins with the letter Tav, which is Tisha B'Av. Tisha, Tisha B'Av is always the... Uh, is always the um, the first same day as first day Pesach, and this links the Seder night to the temple. We don't have a temple anymore, and therefore we cannot fulfill Pesach in the same way. Yeah, Riley, you had a question. Riley, Riley, you have a question. No. Okay. Alrighty. All right, at the end of the meal, we have tzafun. And um, uh, in our house, we, uh, we hide the afikoman. And we normally put the afikoman in a special bag because otherwise uh, the children will say, we found the afikoman, and we say, which piece of, uh, piece of bread is this one? So we hide, the afi- we hide the afikoman in a special afikoman bag, and we hide it somewhere in the house. Um, and then the game begins. Uh, normally, it's very, for a person, it's very difficult to hide the afikoman because always uh, the kids are always watching me. So we have to come up with the novel, tri- novel t- ideas and novel tricks to hide the afikoman. But that's definitely something that keeps the kids awake until the end of the Seder. One of the interesting things to, uh, to, be, to be aware of is that eating the afikoman is not just a little uh, piece of, uh, of the matzah. It is a full, it's a, it's a full uh, it's a sheet of matzah, 28 grams which is uh, almost one, sh- one complete sheet of matzah. So at the end of the Seder, when you've had your, your, your egg and salt water, if you had your soup and your knedel, and you've had your main course, and you had your dessert, now we get to the afikoman, make sure you've left a bit of space uh, for it as well. Afikoman is eaten, leaning to the left, because it is a symbol of freedom. Once we finish afikoman, we then head to the next stage, which is barech, the traditional grace after the meals is then recited, and this is what we call we call benching, right? Uh, which means to bless. At the end of the benching, which uh, uh, the third cup of wine is drunk, and we've now done three quarters of the seder. Now, where at this moment when we get to Hallel, most uh, most people are now but tired, 
But Hallel, but Hallel, but the Hallel part in the second half of the Seder takes us to a place where we, we have never seen yet. Seder night is a night of redemption of the Jewish people. And we, uh, and we, want, to, uh, we want to pray for the ultimate redemption when the Jewish people are saved and back in the land of Israel with no one, no one to make us afraid anymore. And the herald of this person is the, is the Messiah, Mashiach. So when, the, uh, we pour, when we pour the fourth cup, we also pour a special cup for Elijah the prophet. According to tradition, it will be Elijah, Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet, <clears throat> that will herald the, uh, the ultimate redemption. And, there, and, then, and hence, we're not afraid. So we walk to the door, we open the door, because maybe tonight is the night that Mashiach is going to, that it will happen. And then we continue the Seder with the songs of Hallel, and what is called the Hallel Hagadol. And this is, uh, and this, uh, and all these songs, and uh, if you look at the, at the words of the songs that we're, that we're going to follow after the meal till the end of the Seder, all refer to, to a time in the future, whether it is uh, the Shana Abab Yerushalayim, Jerusalem being rebuilt, Adir Hu, Givne Beitel Bakarov, Adir Hu, may Hashem rebuild the temple soon in our times so and we can celebrate properly uh, the, Pesach, the, the Pesach as it's supposed to be. And we drink, and uh, with the high end of Hala, we drink the fourth cup of wine. The last, uh, the last section is called Nirza. And by this stage, you should have had four cups of wine. You'd be quite excited to be uh, to be singing and uh, and, uh, and 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 get very, very much very much loud as possible. Um, and the uh, the highlights of this uh, of this uh, section are a number of important songs. Um, the Shana Babi Shalim. Next year, may we be married to rebuild Jerusalem. Echad mi Odea, Who knows one? And uh, and this and this song is um, yeah. In the one hand, is a nice is a game, right? And the one part of the game I play with my uh, with my kids and my community is okay. Who, who knows one? We say one is Hashem. Two are the tablets. Three are the fathers. And I ask, who are the three fathers? Who are the four mothers? Who are the what are the five books of the Torah? What are the six books of the Mishnah? And we see if we can get all those. Uh, uh, we can actually name them all, not just singing them all. But the main, that the end point is one is Hashem. That ultimately, the the faith of the Jewish people is that there that it all comes down to Hashem. That uh, that we the Jewish people have a special relationship with us with God, and uh, we have faith in Him. And the same faith that sustained the Jewish people during the uh, during the time of the uh, the slavery in Egypt, that same faith has may, may maintain and sustain the Jewish people for the for the thousands of years of exile. It is for no reason. It is for that reason, uh, not surprising then, that the name of the uh, Israeli national anthem should be Hatikva, the hope, because uh, it's all about the hope in the future and the ultimate redemption. And then finally, we conclude with that great song of Chad Gadya, the one little goat. And the uh, the question is, what's that song all about? It's a it's a later edition. It's not mentioned in the Talmud. Well, all, the, all in the early writings. Maimonides does not bring it down in his Haggadah, but it's a, so it's a, it seems to be a renaissance, uh, late, uh, late Middle Ages uh, addition to the Seder. And the Chad, and the Chad Gadya is, um, is explained by, by the Vilna Gaon and others, is an, a parable, is an, is an analogy of uh, the story of the Jewish people throughout its exiles. That uh, the little goats, is uh, of course is the Jewish people, the uh, the one little goats that our father bought for two zuzim, the two zuzim representing the, ta- the the two tablets, and then the cat represents Egypt, and then we uh, and then we work our way through the different uh, exiles that the Jewish people have uh, have endured. Ultimately, it is Akadosh Baruch Hu. Right, uh, that, uh, we, we go through the different things, the shochet. Uh, some say represents the the Romans and the and the and the last two thousand years. Malach Amavet, the angel of death, is uh, of course the uh, will ultimately be defeated by Hashem, and the one little goat will uh, will survive uh, survive at the end. So this little the, so this little goat, this Chad Gadya, is the uh, is the ultimate symbol of the Jewish people. That uh, we have the uh, uh, the greatest ally in the world in Hashem looking after us, and these are the messages that we want our children to go to go to bed with. Uh, that uh, faith in a, that we are part of the most amazing people, 
a people that's had a history of over 4,000 years, that, uh, that the little goat has survived all the, uh, the attacks against it. Uh, why? Because of the faith we have in Hashem. i just like to, uh, to conclude with, uh, with something that's, uh, that's become quite uh, surreal and quite real for us. That this year, 2020, uh, say it will be very different. For families, we won't, uh, many won't be able to be with, uh, with their loved ones. And they'll be uh, spending Seder uh, by themselves or with just the, uh, the, the immediate family. Um, but in terms of what we will be experiencing this year, and there are certain times when one has to just pause and take stock and go, like, wow, I'm actually living through history. This will be only the second Seder in the, uh, or the second time in history when Am Yisra, when, uh, when, when everyone has to stay home. Right? The Jewish people were told by Moshe, stay uh, the night of the Exodus, you have to stay home. Do not go out. Share a meal with your family and, uh, and share a meal with your loved ones. The, do not go out because there's a mashchit, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a destroyer outside. And this year and this year, we will be experiencing that same feeling. So if I can say, if I, one thing I can ask of you is that this Seder, as unique, as, as strange, as unique as it will be, is a historic Seder. And one that we should all, to, we should all think about. When I teach my bar mitzvah boys, and, and, and I, at the end of their bar mitzvah, they're standing on the bima. I say to them, you've walked up the steps as your father and your grandfather have done. You said the same blessings as they have. And I want you to look out at the community and take a virtual, a, a, a photo in your uh, mental photograph. Because this moment I want, uh, want, uh, should stay with you for the rest of your life. And I say to you as well, this year's Seder is one for the memories. It is one that you should definitely take a mental photograph because in years to come, we will be talking about this Seder as one, as one of the most unique and special ones uh, in history. And for, and for those who are very young and listening to, the, very young and listening to this, um, may we all... Oh, kidding me. Uh, very young and listening to this, uh, let this memory ca- carry with you for the rest of your life. Thanks so much for listening. Manishma. Right.